Well, that last video was quite exciting, wasn't it? Let's have a look and see if we can figure out why the dry shaft broke. There's something I've noticed straight away. I've got it tied down at the front because I was somewhere near full forward when this broke. And at full forward, this shaft is probably down the bottom of its travel. I don't know that for sure because it's spinning and under torque, but that fall down, which is not something I've noticed before, it doesn't actually go full over. If you rotate it slightly, now it's full over. If you turn it back to where it was, it won't actually go. So that could have been, well, it definitely would have been putting a bending torque on, um, on the bottom joint. If you lift it up and away from the full travel, you know, there's no issue whatsoever with articulation. When I made this shaft, uh, I drilled all the way through, so it is a tube, but I recessed the bottom so that I could get a spring in there. And I did have a spring in there. Um, it broke, so I took it out. Um, but that was just an attempt to keep the shaft in the middle. It wasn't a full travel stop. It was just to try and push the shaft up and take some of the weight and take it off the, uh, the tilting head. That is a possible reason, but I don't remember this shaft being quite so close to here. It'd be somewhere around there. I don't remember it being that close to that tube. This tube is dented in as well. So something's moved, the engine's moved or the frame's moved, I reckon. Cause it, I think it was about there somewhere. It's more or less in the middle. For the people that are new to the channel, this is the bit that broke. And it was my bit I made that broke rather than the manufactured CV joint, which is this bit here. That had a spigot coming on out the top of there and that went down inside the clutch and there's a roller bearing and you see the rest of it down there. And there it is. It's only 15 millimeters diameter. And that's the failure. Looks like a fatigue failure to me, but I'm not an expert in materials. What that part did was to keep this from doing that. I wanted flex actually, but I needed to keep it straight. Obviously this part wasn't strong enough to do that. At full forward cyclic, the shaft was never under full extension both ends. The shaft was always had some play up and down. But if the, the weight of the shaft was enough to, to drop it down to the lower section of the joint, then that would be enough to, to break it. There was quite a lot of comments about having a universal joint each end and then a slip joint in the middle. And this is actually what I bought to begin with. It was a Suzuki Jimny front prop shaft and it had the slip joint via a spline um, but when I put that spline under torque engine torque I couldn't move it so it had to be really freely moving under torque and that's why I went for this type of CV joint. I was also told that you could get a roller bearing type slip joint with uh, two universal joints and yeah I think that would be that would be the solution. I could do that and I could go on but there's a few things I don't like about this design, which I'll explain now. When I started building this, I took inspiration from the Nolan brothers on YouTube, uh, the Benson B9 and the Air Scooter 2. And they used fixed pitch rotors. I couldn't find reasons online to why fixed pitch rotors were not common. I only really found the information online about these machines saying how easy they are to fly and um, you know how simple they are but nothing really all that negative and I wasn't a pilot before this I had no experience in helicopters and so I thought well let's just try it see see what there is to learn and now I've tried it I'm not all that keen uh, when you get a, a wing gust you'll suddenly go up and 
you can't react that quickly without uh, blade feathering. The other obvious reason for blade feathering or collective pitch is due to auto rotation. Well, this machine was never intended to go above a few feet, so really I didn't think auto rotation was uh, of all that benefit. Even at a few feet, if you've got blade feathering or collective pitch, then um, you can do a hovering auto. With a fixed pitch, the blades are extremely light. There's very little inertia in them, and that is what you want if you're relying on engine RPM to control your altitude. There's not even um, a rotor overrun I designed into the drive system. I wanted the rotors to spool down really quickly so um, it, there wasn't a delayed reaction. If you wanted to go down, it would come down quickly with the decay in rotor RPM. So those are the reasons I don't like fixed pitch. Uh, next, the tilting mast, and there's reasons I don't like that. Gyrocopters use a tilting mast and they do it very successfully. But when you've got a coaxial and the hinge is there and you've got all that distance to the top rotor, that has an effect on the handling. With a gyrocopter, the distance between the hinge point and the rotor is not very, not very long compared to this huge distance. What this means is when you've got all this leverage to move around, this spinning rotor is quite a lot of mass and it has to be moved or tries to move and instead what it tends to do is uh, weight shift the machine and um, when you're making small inputs on the cyclic um, it's pretty easy to move around um, there's not much force on the cyclic at all until you want a bigger more abrupt movement then it becomes increasingly harder i don't like this um, varying degrees of cyclic force needed to control it if the hinge was up here somewhere in the middle, that would be a different scenario and you wouldn't have this leverage problem. So that is why I don't like a tilting mast on a coaxial when there's so much distance between the pivot and the top rotor. It's been really nice to have all those comments uh, of people saying to carry on, um, but it's not just about the drive shaft. And I could turn this machine into a cyclic and collective pitch type control. It would mean a new drive, uh, change the drive shaft, obviously, um, new blades. You'd have to have new blades, new road heads, all this, basically all this mechanical stuff here. And it's, it's probably about two years work, I reckon. I haven't decided if I'm going to do that or not at this stage. Um, the other option is to build a complete new machine, perhaps go to a single rotor and tail rotor like everybody else does. It certainly gave me uh, an idea of how the pioneers felt uh, trying to teach yourself to fly an unproven uh, design. You can certainly place yourself back in that era. Quite astonishing people, I'd say. This sort of thing is not for the faint hearted. I must say that the expertise in the comments has been quite surprising. Um, some really, really helpful people out there. Uh, to start with, before I put this on YouTube, I was you know, working alone and uh, I didn't have an awful lot of help other than a neighbor who had also built one. And he's uh, one of the reasons I, I started on this quest. But doing this and put it on YouTube means, um, you know, you, you can make some, some good friends that can really help you. Having taken what I've learned building this, uh, you know, I think the next one would be a huge amount more likely to, to succeed. I mean, I'm happy with what this achieved. Um, it, to get off the ground was, you know, the priority really. Um, I did imagine myself uh, flying slowly around a field and I didn't quite, um, didn't quite make that goal. There will be another project. I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going to go in yet. If we take the progression, um, I started with an electric bicycle. That was the last project and I've gone to a helicopter. So really, the next project, I think, should be a spaceship. I've always wanted to go to the moon, and I think the view would be fantastic. Looking back at that lovely flat Earth, and then perhaps gazing out of those billions of round planets. <laughs>